All right, well, thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm Oscar Ramirez, Sergio, and uh, we're from the TF Agents team, and we'll talk to you guys about our project. So for those of you that uh, don't know, uh, TF Agents is our reinforcement learning library uh, built in TensorFlow. And it's a um, hopefully reliable, scalable, and easy to use uh, library. Uh, we package it with a lot of collabs, examples, and documentation to try and make it easy for people to jump into reinforcement learning. Um, and we use it internally to actually solve a lot of difficult tasks with reinforcement learning. Um, it has, uh, in our experience, it's been um, pretty easy to uh, develop new RL algorithms. And we have a whole bunch of tests, easy to make it easy to configure and reproduce results. Um, a lot of this like wouldn't be possible without everyone's contributions. So just want to make sure, um, make it clear. Like this has been a, a team effort. There's been a lot of twenty percenters, um, external contributors. Uh, people have gone and come and gone uh, within the team as well. And so this is kind of right now the uh, uh, biggest chunk of like the, the current uh, team that is working on TF agents. Um, with that, I'll, I'll let Sergio talk a bit more about RL in general. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, hi, everyone. So we're going to focus a little more about reinforcement learning and how this is different from other kinds of machine learning and supervised learning, supervised learning, and other flavors. Here's like three examples. Like one is like a robotics a game, and the other one is like a recommender system. That's a clear example like where you can apply reinforcement learning. Uh, so basically, the basic idea is like something like if you were to try to teach someone how to walk, it's very difficult because it's really difficult for me to explain you what you need to do to be able to walk, you know, coordinate your legs in this case of the robot or even for a kid. How you teach someone how to walk is really difficult. They need to figure it out themselves. How? Trial and error. You try a bunch of times, you fall down, you get up, and then you learn as you fall in. And that's basically, you can think of it like the reward function. No? You get reward, positive reward, or negative reward every time you try. So here you can see also like even within the RL algorithms, these things start happening. No? After a few trials of learning, this robot is able to move around, wobble a little bit, and then fall. But now he can control the legs a little more, not quite walk, but doing better than before. After fully training, then the robot is able to walk from one place to another, basically go to a specific location and all those things. So how this happened uh, basically is summarized in this code, but well, it's a lot of code, but overall the presentations will go about the details. No? This is basically resuming like all the pieces you will need to be able to train a model like this, but we will go into the details. So what is reinforced learning and how does it different basically from other cases? No? The idea is like we have an agent that is trying to play in this case or interact with an environment. In this case, it's like breakout. So basically the idea you need to move the paddle, you know, to the left or to the right to basically hit the ball and break the bricks on the top. So this one generates some observation that the agent can observe. It can basically process that observation, generate a new action, like whether to move the paddle to the left or to the right. And then based on that, it will get some reward. In this case, it will be the score. And then using that information, you will learn from this, this environment how to play. So one thing what is I think is critical for people who have done a lot of supervised learning is what is the main difference between supervised learning and reinforced learning is that for supervised learning, you can think of for every action that you take, they give you a label. An expert will have labeled that case, that example, and give you the right answer. You know, for this specific image, this is an image of a dog. This is an image of a cat. So you know what is the right answer. So every time you make a mistake, I will tell you what is the right answer to that question. In reinforced learning, that doesn't happen. Basically, you are playing this game, you're interacting with the game, you bench a batch of actions, and you don't know which one was the right answer, which was the correct action, and which was the wrong one. You only know this reward function. Tell you like, okay, you are doing kind of okay. You are not doing that well. <laughs> and based on that, you need to infer basically what other possible actions you have taken to improve your reward. Or basically, maybe you're doing well now, but maybe later you do worse. So it's also a dynamic process going on over here. How is the reward function different from the label? So I think the main difference is this, is like the reward function is only an indicator you're doing well or, or wrong, but doesn't tell you what is the precise action you need to take. The label is more like the precise at outcome of the model. You can think in supervised learning, I tell you what is the right action. 
I tell you the right answer. If I give you a, a mathematical problem and say X is equal to, that's the right answer. If I tell you you are doing well, you don't know what was the actual answer. You don't know if it was X, X equal to or X equal three. Or if I tell you it's, it's wrong answer, you don't know what was the right answer. So basically that's the main difference between having a reward function that only indicate, it gives you some indication about whether you're doing well or not, but doesn't give you the proper answer or the optimal answer, let's say. Is the reward better to be in a very general instead of very specific? Mm -hmm. Like you are doing well instead of like what you are mm -hmm. moving is yeah. the right direction to go. It depends quite a bit on the environment. Yeah. And there is this whole problem of like credit assignment. Yeah. So trying to figure out what part of your actions were the ones that actually led to you receiving this reward. So if you think about the robot hopping, you could give it a reward that maybe it's its current forward velocity. And you're trying to maximize that, and so the robot should learn to run as fast as possible, right? But maybe like bending the legs down so you can push yourself forward will help you move forward a lot faster. But maybe that action will actually move you backwards a little bit, and you might even get punished instantaneously for that action. But it's part of the whole set of uh, actions throughout an episode that will lead you to moving forward. And so the credit assignment problem is like, all right, there's a set of actions that we might have even gotten negative reward but we need to figure out that those actions led to positive reward down the line. Mm -hmm. And the objective is to maximize a discounted return, so a sum of rewards over a length of uh, time steps. Yeah, that's a thing that's a critical point. In RL, we care about long-term value. It's not only like immediate reward, it's not only you tell me plus one, it's not so important because I want to know, not if I'm playing the game right now, if I'm gonna win the game at the end. That's what I really care, you know? It's like, I am going to be able to move the robot to that position. What I do in the middle, sometimes I do things that are okay, some things are not bad, but sometimes I make an action, maybe I move one leg and I fall, and I cannot recover. But then maybe it was a movement I did 10 steps ago would make my leg wobble. And now how do I connect which action make me fail? Sometimes not very clear. Because in multiple actions, some cases even thousands of actions before you get there to the end of the game, basically. You can think also that in the games, you know, in AlphaGo and all those things, you know, is this stone really going to make you lose? Probably there's no single stone that's going to make you lose. But 200 positions down the line, that stone was actually very critical <laughs> because that have a ripple effect in other actions that happen later, you know, and then you need to be able to estimate this credit assignment problem, like which actions I need to change to improve my reward, basically, over, overall. Uh, so. I think this is to illustrate also a little farther, like different modes of learning, you know? What we said before, you know, supervised learning is more about like the classical, you know, classroom. There's a teacher telling you the right answer, memorize the answer, memorize the, you know? And that's what we do in supervised learning. We almost memorize the answers as we just on generalization. Mostly that's what we do. And then in reinforced learning, it's not so much about memorize the answer because the, if, even if I do the same actions in a different setting, if I say, okay, go to the kitchen in my house, and I say, oh, go to the left, mm -hmm. second door to the right. And then I say, okay, now go to Paige's house and go to the kitchen. If you apply the same algorithm, you will get maybe into the bathroom. <laughs> it's like you go to, two doors to the right, and then you go to the wrong place. So even memorizing the answer is not good enough. You know what I mean? You need to adapt to the environment. So that's what makes reinforced learning a little more challenging, but also more applicable to many other problems in reality. You know, like when you need to play around, you need to interact with the environment. There's no such a thing of like, I can think about what's going to be the best plan ahead of time and never play this with the environment. Uh, we try to write down some of these, you know, things that we just mentioned about like this, that you need to interact with the environment to be able to learn is very critical. If you don't interact, if you don't try to walk, if the robot doesn't try to move, it cannot learn how to walk. So you need to move, interact with the environment. What means also it will put you in weird positions in weird places because you maybe ended up in the end of a corridor or, you know, in a not exit position or maybe even unsafe cases. You know, there's a lot of research also going on about safe RL. How do I explore the wall such as I don't break my robot? You know, like you make a really strong force, you may break the robot, but probably you don't want to do that, <laughs> you know, because you need to keep interacting with the wall. Uh, 
Also, you know, we collect data while we're training. So as we're learning, we're collecting new data, fresh data all the time. So the data set is not fixed, like in supervised learning. We typically assume in supervised learning, we have initial data set at the beginning, and then you just iterate over and over. And here, as you learn, you get fresh data, and then the data change, the distribution of the data change as you get more data. And you can see that also, for example, in like a labyrinth, you know, you don't know where you're going. At the beginning, you probably lost all the time. And you maybe ended up always in the same places. And maybe there's a different part of the labyrinth you never explore. So you don't even know about that. So you cannot learn about it because you have never explored it. So the exploration is very critical in RL. You know, it's not only like you want to optimize and you know exploit mm -hmm. the model that you have. You also need to explore. Sometimes you actually need to do what you think is the wrong thing, but basically go to the left here because you've never been there just to basically explore new areas. Uh, Another thing is like what we said before, like nobody's going to tell you what is the right answer. And actually, in many cases, there's not a right answer. There are multiple ways to solve the problem. You know, the reward only give you an indication you are going the right path or not, but it doesn't tell you what is the right answer. Uh, to train this model, we use a lot of different surrogate losses, what means also they are not actually correlated with performance. Usually, it's very common, and you will see in a moment, when the model is learning, the loss go up. When the model is not learning, the loss go down. So basically, loss going down is usually a bad sign. You know, if your loss is theta zero, you are learning nothing. <laughs> so you will see in a, in, a, in a second, like basically very like how you debug these models became more and more tricky than supervised learning. We very used like we look at loss, our loss go down, beautiful. You know, you take ResNet, ImageNet, the loss always go down. You know, if you do something wrong, the loss go up. You know, otherwise the loss keep going down. In RL. That's not the case. First, we have multiple losses to train, and many of them actually don't correlate with performance. They will go up and down. It looks like random almost. You know? So it's like very hard to debug or tune these algorithms because of that. You actually need to evaluate the model. It's not enough the losses. It's not enough to give you a good sense if you are doing well or not. In addition to that, that means we require multiple optimizers, multiple networks, multiple ways to update the variables and all those things. What mean the typical supervised learning training loop or model fit doesn't fit for all of basically. There's many ways we need to update the variables. None of them use optimizers. Some of them we have multiple optimizers with different frequency, with different ways. Sometimes we optimize one model against a different model and things like that. So basically how we update the models is very different from the typical way of supervised learning. Even though we use some supervised learning losses, basically. Some of the losses are basically supervised. Basically, like you know, regression losses or things like that, or cross entropy. So we use some of those losses, but in different ways, basically. Uh, so probably this graph is not very surprising to most people who have used supervised learning in the last years. It used to be different in the past, but now with neural networks, usually always look like this. You know, they, you start training your model, your mm -hmm. classification loss go down. You know, usually your realization go up because your weights are actually learning something, so they are moving. But your total loss is still, the overall total loss is still go up. The realization loss tend to stabilize usually or go down after learning. Uh, but basically, usually you can guide yourself by your cross entropy loss or total loss to be a really good guide that your model is learning. And if the loss doesn't go down, then your model is not learning, basically. You know that. Uh, I still remember when uh, I was, when I was outside of Google and trying to train Google Net, the first Google Net, mm -hmm. and I couldn't get the loss down. The loss was stable, you know, and initialization could get in that down. And then I need to ask Christian Gessie, it's like, what do you do? How do you do it? It's like, oh, you need to initialize the variables this way. You have to do all these extra tricks. Mm -hmm. And when I did all the tricks, he told me all of a sudden the loss start going down. Uh, but when the loss start going down, the model start learning very quickly. This is where it looks in many cases in RL. We have the after loss that's going up. In this case, it's actually good because it's learning something. We have this alpha loss, which is like almost like noise around zero, it like fluctuates quite a bit. And the critic loss in this case just collapsed, basically. It's like at the beginning it was very high and all of a sudden got very small and then it doesn't move from there. But this model is actually good. This model is learning well. <laughs> so you see all these like, and there's no like a total loss. You cannot aggregate these losses because each one of these losses is, is optimized in different parts of the model. So we don't we optimize each one of them individually. Uh, but the other cases that you see the losses and then basically usually it's like 
the loss will go up, especially sometimes when you are learning something, because you can think about it this way. If you are trying to go through the environment and you see a new room you never see, it's going to be very surprising for the model. So the model is going to try to fit the, this new data and it's basically going to be out of the distribution. So the model is going to say, I don't know, this looks really different to everything I see before, so the loss go up. One you basically learn about this new data, then the loss will go down again. So it's very common that we have many patterns that the loss go up and down as the model start going learning and discover more uh, rooms and more spaces in the environment. But how do we know what the model is doing well if we don't look? So we need to look basically at the reward. So the other function that we said that we actually compute the expected reward, and then basically we take a model, run into the environment, and compute how well it's performing. So the loss itself, it doesn't tell us that. So you're talking about not the rewards during the training, but like a separate reward where you you, you can do existing. both. You can do both. You can compute reward during training, and I already give you a very good signal. But during the training, it would be misleading, right? Because you haven't explored something. Yeah, then you still misleading. Exactly. Really good, right? Yeah. So we do and, usually both. And it's even more uh, deceiving because when you have a policy that you're using to collect data to train on, you sometimes or most of the time will have some form of exploration within that. Either you'll every ten steps you'll do a random action, uh, and that will lead to like widely different uh, rewards over time. But why why is it not misleading even if you do it separately from training? Because ultimately, if your policy is such that it doesn't really explore much, it would always you know when you throw that mm -hmm. policy into like a test environment mm -hmm. and you're no longer modified whatever, but it might still if the policy is just very naive and doesn't want to explore much, it would look great because it does everything's fine. But like, how would you know that it actually mm -hmm. hasn't left? A well, so when, when we're doing evaluations, we want to exploit what we've learned, right? Mm -hmm. So at that point, we're trying to use this to complete the task that we're trying to, to accomplish by training these models. Mm -hmm. And so there, we don't need to explore. Now we're just trying to exploit what we've learned. But if it's not ready to, like, to react to certain things mm -hmm. that, like, if it hasn't explored the space, yeah. mm -hmm. so that it, like, in, in common situations, it would still do well, mm -hmm. but it hasn't explored it enough that if it encounters some issues, it doesn't yeah. know what to do, mm -hmm. that part would not be really reflected by the reward. Yeah, so you, you need to uh, evaluate over a certain number of episodes, and uh, Sergio has a slide on, like... Uh, like, maybe you probably, what you say, like, you actually evaluating once is not enough. You, we usually evaluate it maybe a hundred times. You know, from different initial condition, all that, and then we average because it's true. You could be you all value at once, maybe it looks fine. You never went to the wrong place, you never fall off the cliff, you are totally fine. You value a hundred times, one of them will go off the cliff, you know, because there will gonna be one situation you didn't expect. Also, do you mind clarifying uh, the, mm -hmm. the three types of losses, that, yeah. uh, like what they correspond to? So basically, here the after loss here correspond to this policy, this thing was acting in the environment. Like, like I need to make a decision about which action to take. So we have a model which is basically mm -hmm. say, which action I'm going to take right now? I'm going to move the power to the left or to the right? So that will be the actor. And we have a loss to train that model. Then the critic loss is slightly different. It's going to say, OK, if I'm in this situation and I were to perform this action, how good will that be? So I can decide, should I take right or should I take left? So it's trying to give me a sense, is this action good in this state? And then basically, that's what we call the critic. And then usually the critic is used to train the actor. Basically, say the actor will say, Oh, I'm going to go to the right. And the critic will say, Oh, you go to the right. That's really bad. Because I know I give you a score by negative score. So you should go to the left. But then the critic, then we learn the critic basically by seeing what we, when we, these rewards that we observe during the training. Then that gives us basically the better reward that the critic can learn from. So the critic is basically regressing to those values. So that's the loss for the critic. And in this case, this alpha love loss is basically like, how much exploration and exploitation I should do. It's like, how much entropy do I need to add to my model in the actor? And usually you want to add quite a bit at the beginning of learning. And then when you have a really good model, you don't want to explore that much. So this at, at alpha loss is basically trying to modulate how much entropy do I want to add to my model. Uh, so I can understand the entropy going up during mm -hmm. our training, but why the actor loss in your example is also constantly going? Going up in in your training, in the actor loss um, or the, the actor loss, loss. Yeah. So basically, what happened is like the as I mentioned, the actor loss is trained based on the critic, also. So so basically, like the actor is trying to predict which actions should I make, and the critic is trying to criticize like this is good, this is bad. So the critic is also moving. So the critic, as the critic learns, basically, and be better at scoring this is a good action or not, then the the actor need to change to that. So this also, you can think of this as a kind of like a 
gun going on a little bit. You know, it's not exactly a gun because they don't compete against each other, but it's like a moving target. And sometimes the better the critic less, the actors need to move around. Usually stabilize. The actor loss tend to stabilize way more than the critic loss. The critic loss I have seen in other cases, this one is very stable, but in many other cases, the critic loss go up and down more, much more substantially. Uh, and going back to the question that you did before about like, how do we know if we're doing well? Because what I told you so far is like, there's all these losses that doesn't correlate. They, when we evaluate, we actually don't know how well are we doing. And even more profound is like, if you look to the graph on the left, it's like there's actually two graphs, same algorithm trying to solve the same task, the orange and the blue. The only difference between these two graphs, so higher is better, so like higher return is like this, you're getting better performance, is actually statistically much better than the blue one. But the only difference between these two runs are the random seeds. Everything else is the same. It's the same code, the same task, everything is the same. The only thing that changed is the random seed. It's like basically how the model was initialized. The, and random, seed, the random seed for the training or the random seed for the evaluation? The random seed for the training, mm -hmm. yeah. And then you run, for the evaluation, we will usually run probably, I don't remember, probably 100 random seeds different. For every, every point that you're evaluating here, you will run 100. Uh, so basically to tackle this, what we did is like this work with Stephanie, with basically is like, can we actually measure how reliable is an algorithm? Because RL algorithms are very reliable and it's really hard to compare one algorithm to another, one task to another and all those things. So we basically did a lot of work and we have a you know paper on the code available to basically measure these things. Like, can I statistically measure, is this algorithm better than this one? And not only is better, it's like, it's reliable. Because if I train 10 times and I get 10 different answers, maybe one of them is good, but it's not very reliable. I cannot apply to a real problem because every time I train, I get a very different answer. So basically the broader this, like in the broader these curves are, the less reliable it is because I will get every time I train, I think this one is like, we train 30 different times. And then you see some algorithms will have broader bands and some other will have narrow bands. So the algorithms that have narrow bands are more reliable, basically. So we have ways to measure those, uh, basically, different metrics. But don't you only care about the final point? Why, why would you care about you, the intermediate points? You care about both because uh, let's think about it. Like, for example, like, yeah, I cannot reliable get the final point. It's not good. If one algorithm say one in a, we have some algorithms that do that, but it's not here because they are so bad. Like only one in a hundred, they will get a really high number. You train a hundred times, one of them will be really good, 99 will be really bad. So the question is, which algorithm do you want to use for your model? One that one in a hundred times you run will give you a good answer and it will be really good, or some one was maybe not as good, but consistently will give me maybe 90% of the other one. So basically it's like, we provide different metrics so you can measure all those different things, but it's basically like, be mindful of what you choose. The final score is not the only thing that you care usually for comparing algorithms. You want to, you just want a policy, like you just want to solve this problem. Yeah, the final score is the only thing you care. But if we want to compare algorithms, I want to compare, can I apply this algorithm to a new task? But if I need, if I need to run a hundred times every time I change the task, it's not gonna be very good, very reliable algorithm. Okay, I think we're back to Oscar. Cool. So now that we saw all the problems, let's see like what we actually do in TF agents, like Too try much. and address <laughs> and, and make it possible to, to play with these things. Um, so to, to look at a bigger picture of uh, the components that we have uh, within TF agents, um, we have a very strict separation of how we do our data collection versus how we do our training. Um, and this has been mostly out of necessity where we need to be able to do data collection in a whole bunch of different types of environments. Um, be it like in some production system or uh, on actual real robots or in simulations. Um, and so we need to be able to somehow deploy these policies that were being uh, trained by uh, these agents, uh, interact with this environment, and then store all this data so that we can then sample it for training. And so if we start looking uh, first at like, what do the environments actually look like? Um, and like, if you look at RL and like a lot of the research, there's uh, OpenAI Gym and, and a lot of other environments available through that. And so for TF agents, we make all these available and like easy to use within the library. Uh, this is just a, a sample of, of the environments that are available. Um, 
And so defining the environment, we have uh, this API um, where we can define uh, the environment. Let's, for example, think like what happens if we want to define breakout. Um, the first thing that you need to do is define what your observations and actions are going to look like. Um, this comes a little bit back from when we started, when we were still in TF1, and we really needed these information for uh, building the computation graph, uh, but it's still very useful today. Um, and so what these um, specs, uh, they're basically uh, nested structures of TensorFlow specs that fully define the shapes and types um, of what the observations will look like and what the actions will look like. And so we think uh, specifically for breakout, maybe the observation will be the image of the game screen. Um, and the actions will probably be like moving the paddle left, moving it right, and maybe firing so that you can actually like launch the ball. Um, so once you've defined what your data is going to look like, uh, there's two main methods and environments that you have to define as a user, um, how the environment gets reset and how the environment gets stepped. And so a reset will basically initialize the state of the environment um, and give you the initial observation. And when you're stepping, you'll receive some action. Um, if the state of the environment is that we reach the final state, it will automatically reset the environment. Otherwise, it will use that action to transition from your current state to a next state. And this will give you the next state's observation and some reward. And we encapsulate this into a time step that includes that kind of information. Um, and so if we're wanting to play uh, breakout, we would create an instance of this environment. We'll get some policy, either like scripted or from some agent that we're training. And then we would simply iterate uh, to try and figure out like, all right, how well are we doing over an episode? Um, this is basically a simplification of what the code would look like if we we're trying to evaluate how good a specific policy is on, on some environment. Um, in order to actually scale and like train this, it means that like we actually have to be collecting a lot of data to be able to train on these environments and, and with these methods. And so we provide the tooling to be able to parallelize this. And so you can create multiple instances of this environment um, and train in a batch setting or collect data in a batch setting where uh, we have this uh, TensorFlow wrapper around the environment um, that will like, internally use um, NumPy functions to interact with the, the Python environment. And we'll then batch all of these uh, instances and give us batched time steps uh, whenever we do the reset. Um, and then we can use the policy to evaluate and, and generate actions for every single instance of this environment at the same time. Uh, and so uh, normally when training, we'll deploy several uh, jobs that are doing collection in a bunch of environments at the same time. Um, and so once we know how to interact with the environment, um, you can think of the driver and the observer. These are basically like a for loop. There's an example down the line. Um, but all of that data will be collected somewhere. Mm -hmm. And in order to do training, what we do is we rely on the data set APIs uh, to be able to sample experience out of the data sets that we're collecting. And the agent will be consuming this experience and will be training the model that it, it has. In most situations, it's a neural network. In some of the uh, algorithms, it's not even a neural network um, in examples like bandits. And so we're trying to, to train this learnable policy um, based purely on the experience that is mostly the observations that we've done in the past. And what this policy needs to do is it's a function that maps from some form of an observation to an action. And that's what we're trying to train in order to maximize our long-term rewards. Um, over some episode. And so how are these policies built? Well, first, we'll have to define some form of network um, to, to back it or to, to generate the model. Uh, in this case, we inherit from uh, the Keras networks and um, add a couple of utility things, uh, especially to be able to generate copies of these networks. Um, and so and here, we'll basically define, all right, uh, we'll have um, a sequential um, model with some conv layers, um, some fully connected layers. And then um, if this was, for example, for uh, DQN, we would have a, a last layer that would give us a predicted Q value, which is basically predicting how good is this action at a given state. Um, it would tell us what probabilities we should be sampling the different kinds of actions that we have. Um, and then within the call method, we'll be taking some observation uh, we'll iterate over our layers and generate um, some predictions that we want to use to generate actions. Um, 
And then we have this concept of a policy, and the policy what uh, will do is it will know, given whatever algorithm we're trying to train, um, the type of network that you're training might be different. And so in order to be able to generalize across the different algorithms or agents that we're implementing, the concept of the policy will know, given uh, some set of networks, how do we actually use these to take observations and generate actions? Um, and normally, uh, the way we do this is that we have a distribution method that will take this time step and maybe some policy state uh, whenever you're training some recurrent models, for example, and we'll be able to apply this network and then know how to use the output of the network in order to generate either some form of distribution. Um, in some agents, this might be a deterministic distribution that we can then sample uh, from. Um, and then when doing data collection, um, we might be sampling from this distribution, we might add some randomness to it. Um, when we're doing evaluations, we'd be doing a greedy policy version of this policy, where we'll take the mode of this distribution in order to uh, try to exploit the knowledge that we've uh, gathered and try to maximize our, our return over the episodes when uh, evaluating. And so one of the big things with uh, uh, 2.0 is that we can now rely on safe models to export all these uh, policies. And this made it a lot easier to generalize and be able to say, oh, hey, now it doesn't matter what agent you use to train. It doesn't matter how you generated your network. You just have this safe model that you can call action on, and you can uh, deploy it onto your robots, production, wherever, and collect data for training, for example, or for serving uh, the trained model. Um, and so within the safe model, we generate all these concrete functions uh, and save and, and expose uh, an action method. Uh, getting an initial state, again, for the case where we have recurrent models. Uh, and we also get the, the training step, which can be used for like annotating the, the data that we're collecting. Um, and right now, the um, one thing that we're still working on or that we need to work on is that uh, we rely on TensorFlow probability for a lot of the distribution stuff that we use. Uh, but this is not part of core TensorFlow, and so safe models can generate distributions easily. And so we need to work on that a little bit. Um, the other thing that we do is that we generate different versions of the safe model, uh, depending on whether this policy will be used for data collection versus for evaluation. Um, it will have baked in whatever exploration strategy we have within the safe model. Um, and right now, uh, I'm working on making it uh, so that we can easily load checkpoints into the safe model and update the variables. And so because for a lot of these methods, when we're generating the safe models, we have to do this very frequently. Um, but the safe model, like the actual graph, uh, computation graph that it needs to generate, like it's the same every step. And so right now we're saving a lot of extra stuff that we don't need to. And so just being able to update it on the fly. Um, but overall, this is like much easier than what we had to do in TF1, where like we were stashing placeholders and like collections and then being able to like rewire like how we were uh, feeding uh, uh, data into the, the safe models. Um, so, so one question about yeah. the, the you you talk about distribution distribution part in same model. So mm -hmm. if your if your function fit into same model dot save is already a distributed function, then mm -hmm. it should be able to support like you you can like dump it. So we we can have the distributions within it, but we can't easily look at those distributions and modify them when we deploy it. Uh, like the return of a, of, a, of a safe model function cannot be a distribution object. It could only be the output of it. It can only be a tensor. Basically, the only yeah. outputs that the basically concrete functions take in and out are tensors. It cannot be an actual distribution object because the other thing is like we sometimes we need to do like sampling logics. We need to do functions that belong to the distribution object. I see. Oh. Yeah. So we do some tricks in replay buffer and everything, basically it's like stored information that we need to reconstruct the distribution back. Basically, like I know this object is gonna be a categorical distribution and because I know that then I can basically get the parameters of the categorical distribution, rebuild the object again with these parameters. And now I can sample, I can do all these other things from the distributions. Uh, through the safe model is still tricky. I mean, we can still save that kind of information, but it's not very clear like, how much information should be part of the same model, or, should, or is part of us basically monkey, you know, monkey patching the thing to basically get what we need, basically. And the, the other problem with it is that as we export all these um, different safe models to do data collection or evaluation, 
Uh, we want to be able to be general to what agent trained this, what kind of policy it really is, and uh, what kind of network is backing it. Uh, and so then like trying to stash all that information in there can be tricky as well to generalize over. Um, and so if we go back circle now, like we have all these saved models, and all of these are basically being used for the data collection. Um, and so collecting experience, basically, uh, we'll have, again, some environment. Now we have an instance of this replay buffer. Uh, where we'll be putting all this uh, data that we're collecting on. And we have this concept of a driver that will basically utilize some policy. This could be either directly from the agent, or it could be a, a state model that's been loaded um, when we're doing it in a distributed fashion. Um, and we define this um, concept of an observer, which will, as the driver is evaluating this policy with the environment, every instance, every observer that's passed to the driver we'll be able to take a look at the trajectory that was generated at that time step and use it to do whatever. And so in this case, we're adding it to the replay buffer. If we're doing evaluation, we would be computing some metrics based on the trajectories that we're observing, for example. And so once you have that, you can actually just run the driver and do the data collection. Um, and so if we look at the agents, we have a whole bunch of agents that are readily available in the open source setup. Um, all of these have a whole bunch of tests, uh, both uh, quality and speed regression tests uh, as well. Um, and we've been fairly selective to make sure that we like, pick state-of-the-art agents or uh, methods within RL that um, have proven to like, be relevant over longer periods of time, um, because um, maintaining these agents is a lot of effort. And so um, we have limited manpower to actually maintain these. So we try to uh, be conservative on, on what we expose publicly. Um, and so looking at how agents are defined um, or in their API, the, the main things that we want to do with an agent is be able to access different kinds of policies that we'll be using, um, and then being able to train um, given some experience. And so we have uh, a collection policy that you, you would use um, to, to gather all the experience that you want to train on. We have a train method that you feed in experience, um, and you actually get some losses out, and that will do the updates to the model. Um, and then you have the actual policy that you want to use to actually exploit things. In most agents, this ends up being a greedy policy, like I mentioned, where in the distribution method, we would just call the mode uh, to actually get the best action that we can. Um, and so putting it together with a network, we instantiate some form of network that the agent expects. Uh, we give that in some optimizer, and there's a whole bunch of other parameters for the agent. Um, and then from the replay buffer, we can generate a data set. Um, in this case, uh, for DQN, we need to train with transitions. So we need like a time step, an action, and the time step that happened afterwards. Uh, and so we have this num steps parameter equal to two. And then we simply sample the data set and do some training. Um, and. Um, yeah, and so normally, if you want to do this uh, sequentially, where you're actually doing some collection and some training, uh, the way that it would look is that you have the same components, but now we alternate between collecting some data with the driver and um, the environment, and training on sampling the data that we've collected. Um, and so um, this can sometimes have a lot of different uh, challenges where um, this driver is actually executing a policy and interacting with the Python environment outside of like the TensorFlow context. And so a lot of the eager utilities uh, have come in a lot, uh, really, really handy for doing a lot of these things. Um, and so mapping a lot of these APIs back into the, the overview, um, if we start with a replay buffer and go clockwise, we'll have some replay buffer that we can sample through data sets. Uh, we'll have the concept of an agent, you know, for example, DQ an agent that we can train based on this data. Um, this is training some form of network that were defined. Um, and the network is being used by the policies that the agents can create. We can then deploy these either through state models or in the same uh, job and utilize the drivers to interact with the environment and collect experience through these observers back into the replay buffer. And then we can iterate between the data collection and, and training. Um, and then recently, with a lot of help, we've been uh, getting things to work with uh, TPUs and accelerators and distribution strategies. Um, and so the biggest thing here is that in order to keep all these accelerators like actually busy, um, we really need to scale up the data collection uh, rate. Uh, and so depending on the environments, 
for example, in some cases in the robotics use cases, you might be able to get one or two time steps a second of data collection. Uh, and so then you need a couple thousand jobs just to do the data, enough data collection uh, to be able to do the training. Um, in some other scenarios, you might be uh, collecting data based on like user interactions, and then you might only get like one sample per user per day. Uh, and so then you have to like be able to scale that up. Um, and then um, on the distributed side, all the data that's being collected will be captured into some replay buffer, and then we can just use distribution strategies um, to be able to, to sample that and pull it in, and then distribute it across either GPUs or TPUs um, to do all the training. And then I'll give it to Sergio for a, a bit, a quick intro into bandits. Mm -hmm. So as we can be talking, is like RL can be challenging in many cases. So what happened like, this uh, subset of RL, what is called multi-arm bandit, we will go a little bit, but it's like simplifies another assumptions and it can be applied to, you know, a reduced set of problems, but it's, they are much easier to train, much more easier to understand. So I want to cover this because for many people who are new to RL, I recommend them to start with bandits first. And then if they don't work, it's still for your problem, then you go to look into a full RL algorithm. And, and basically the main difference between, you know, multi-arm bandits and RL is like basically here you make a decision every time, but it's basically like every time you make a decision, the game starts again. So one action doesn't influence the others. So basically there's no such a thing of like long-term consequences. So you can make a decision every single time and that will not inter influence the state of the environment in the future, what means a lot of things you can assume and simplify in your models. And this one basically like you don't need to worry about like what actions do I took in the past? How do I do credit assignment? Because now it's very clear. If I make this action and I get some reward, it's because of this action because there's no more sequence of actions anymore. And also here you don't need to plan ahead, you know? So basically it's like uh, I don't need to think about like what's gonna happen after I make this action because it's gonna have some consequences later. In the bandit's case, you assume all those things are independent. Basically, you assume every time you make an action, you can start again playing the game from scratch every single time. Uh, this is used to be done more commonly with A-B testing. You're probably for people who know what A-B testing does. It's like, imagine you have different four different flavors of your, I don't know, site or problem or diff four different options you can offer to the users. Which one is the best? You offer follow all of them to different users and then you compute which one is the best. And then after you figure out which one is the best, then you serve the option to everyone. So basically what happened during the time that you're offering these four actions to everyone, you basically, some people are getting the wrong, not the optimal uh, option, basically. During the time you are exploring, basically figure out which is the best action during that time. So now the people are not getting the best possible answer. So that was called regret. Basically, like how much I could have gone better that I didn't do because I didn't give you the best answer from the beginning. So with multi arm bandits, what he tried to do is like, basically, is as you go, adapt how much exploration do I need to do and how much, how confident I am that my model is good. So basically, it will start the same thing as A-B testing. Like at the beginning, it will give a random answer to every user. But as soon as some users like, oh, this is better, I like it, it will start sifting. I say, okay, I should probably go to that option. Everybody seems to be liking. So as soon as you start figure out, you know, you are very confident that your model is getting better, then you basically start sifting and maybe serving everyone the same answer. So basically, the amount of regret, like how much time you have given the wrong answer, decrease faster. So basically, the multi arm bandit is what they try to like estimate how confident I am about my model. When I'm not very confident, I explore. When I became very confident, then I don't explore anymore. I start exploiting. Uh, one example that is typically used for understanding multi arm bandit is like recommending movies. You know, like you have a bunch of movies I could recommend you. There's some probability that you may like this movie or not. And then I have to figure out which movie to recommend you. And then to make it even more personalized, you can use context. You can use basically user information. You can use previous things as your context. But the main thing is like, you're not basically gonna make a recommendation today and that doesn't influence which recommendation I make tomorrow. And uh, so basically like, if I knew this were the probability that you like Star Wars, I probably should recommend you Star Wars. What happened is before I start recommending you things, I don't know what do you like, basically. Only when I only when I start recommending you things and you like some things and don't like other things, then I learn about your taste and then I can update my model basically based on that. Uh, so basically, here there are different algorithms basically in this experiment. Like you know, some of them 
you know, how much, you know, here lower is better. Like, is this regret? It's like, how much can I offer you the optimal solution, basically? Like, some of them, they basically like very random. It's like, it takes forever. It doesn't learn much. Uh, some of them that you just do this epsilon greedy, like basically random give you something sometimes and otherwise the best. And then there's other methods that use like more fancy algorithms, like, yeah. Uh, Thompson sampling or dropout Thompson sampling, where it's like more advanced algorithms that basically will give you basically better trade-offs between exploration and exploitation. So for all those things, we have tutorials in the you know GitHub page and everything, so you can actually play with all these algorithms and basically learn. And I usually recommend like try to apply a bad new algorithm to your problem first, because it makes more assumptions. But if it works, it's better. It's easier to train and easier to use. If it doesn't work, then go back to the RL algorithms. And these are some of them who are available uh, currently in within uh, TF agents. You know, some of them I already mentioned, and some of them you know use neural networks. Some are more like you know linear models. Some of them use like um, upper bounds about the confidence. So they try to estimate how confident I am about my model and all those things uh, to basically get this exploration exploitation trade off uh, right. Uh, as I mentioned, you can apply to many of the recommender systems. You know, you can imagine. You know, I want to make a recommendation, and I don't know what you like. I try different things, and then based on that, I improve my model. You know? And then this model gets very complicated when you start doing personalized recommendations. Uh, finally, I want to talk about a couple of things. Some of them is like about roadmap, like where is TF agents going uh, forward. Uh, some of the things we already hint, but for example, like adding new algorithms and new Agents, we are working on that. For example, Bootstrap DKN, I think it's almost ready to be open source. We are before we open source any of this algorithm. What we do is we verify them, we make sure they are correct, we get the right numbers, and we also add to the continuous testing so they stay correct over time. Because in the past, it will happen to us also like, oh, we are good, it's ready, we put it out. One week later, it doesn't work anymore. And now something changed somewhere in the, you know, who knows, in our code base, in TensorFlow code base, in TensorFlow probability, somewhere something changed somewhere. And now the performance is not the same. So now we have this continuous testing to make sure they stay that working. Uh, so we plan to, you know, have this leatherboard and pre-trained model release, adding more distributed, especially for replay buffers and distributed collection, distributed training. Uh, what Oscar was mentioning at the beginning, uh, maybe thinking in the future to add another new environment, you know, like Unity or like other uh, environments that people are interested in. Uh, this is a graph that I think is relevant for people who are like, okay, how much time do you actually spend doing the core algorithm? Like you can think of as the blue box. Basically, that's the algorithm itself, that's the agent. And I would say it's probably 25% of our time is developed into the actual algorithm and all those things. All the other time is the is spent in other things within the team, you know. Replay buffer is quite a bit of time consuming. TF2, like we did when we did the migration for TF1 to TF2, it took a really good chunk of our time basically to make that migration. And uh, right now our library you can run in both TF1 and TF2. So we spend quite a bit of time to make sure that is possible. Like all the core of the library, you can run, only the binary is different, but the core of the library can run in both TF1 and TF2. And uh, usability also, we spend quite a bit of time, like how to make like refined APIs, do I need to change this, how easy is to use, all those things. And we still have a lot of work to do. So we are not done with that. And tooling, you know, like all this testing, all this benchmarking, all the continuous uh, evaluation, all those things, this tooling we have to build around it to basically make it this like successful. Uh, um, finally, I think, you, you know, for those of you who, you know, didn't get the link at the beginning, is basically you can go to GitHub TensorFlow agents, you can, you know, get the package by pip install, you can start learning about, you know, using or collabs or tutorials with the key and carpool, the Minutar that we saw at the beginning, you can go and train yourself in a collab was really good. And, we end to solve like important problems. That the other part we really care about, like, is like make sure we are production quality, basically. The code base, the test, everything we do is like we can deploy these models and all those things. So you can actually use to solve important problems. Not only we usually use like, games as an example because they're easy to understand and easy to play around them, but many of the cases we really apply to you know more real problems. And we actually is designed with that in mind. We welcome contributions and pull requests. Uh, we, you know, try to review as best as we can with new environments, new algorithms, or 
new contributions to the uh, library. <laughs>